have at the table Amy Bloom, New York Times best-selling author. How cool is that to have? I love when they say at that. At the end of your name. <laughs> we should also point out that you're a professor of creative writing at Wesleyan University, have written many, many books. The latest book that you've written, about to come out now, but we have a little copy of it here, is White Houses. And it's the story of Eleanor Roosevelt and her secretary and their love affair. Why did you want to write this book? Well, I didn't know I wanted to write this book. I it had found done a, you? It did find me. It, it found me and it sort of turned me upside down and it made me write a novel that had never occurred to me about people who existed in the world, which had also never occurred to me. All of my previous novels, I make up all those people. And um, it feel, felt in some ways a little safer to make them up and a little riskier to have them be real people who have real letters and real speeches and real photographs. But when I was researching another book, and uh, the Roosevelt's came up a lot because I was writing about the 30s and 40s, there is a beautiful biography of Eleanor Roosevelt by Blanche Wise and Cook, and she talks about these 3,000 letters, these 18 boxes of letters at the Roosevelt Library between Eleanor Roosevelt and another woman who was known then as the first friend, Lorena Hickok, who herself was a journalist, and not just a journalist, but a famous journalist. She was the first woman in America to get a byline with the New York Times. She was a big deal. and. Um, really gave up her journalism career to be with Eleanor because she felt it was a conflict of interest and unethical to be a reporter and keeping back information. This is going on at the same time that President Roosevelt had his paramour. Well, he was a busy man. I mean, <laughs> and also, I, you, you got to give the guy credit. A lot of stamina, and he was in a wheelchair, and he had more than one lady on the side. When, when I was reading the book and reading about the research that you did and going to the presidential library, these 3,000 letters and some that were burned. Yes. How, as a journalist, immersing myself in that and writing a book, how many years did you spend among well, those? You know, I'm a middle-aged woman. I don't like to dwell on exactly how many years <laughs> it took. To but I was like, yeah, it was, it was a couple of years. And I did feel the wish to keep moving and also to see the letters. I mean, to take the lid off the box and there are the letters and the Xeroxes of the letters, all in beautiful penmanship. And the warmth and then the growing passion. And then there is a cooling of the passion, but a deepening of the friendship. I mean, they stayed in touch. They wrote to each other at the height of their love affair. They wrote to each other four or five times a day. But, um, and Lorena, bless her heart, who was always the more discreet and the more cautious because she was not born to privilege and power and worried about things far more than Eleanor did. Eleanor's stance on the entire thing of gossip about the two of them was, people hate me anyway. What difference does it make? Whereas Lorena was always trying to protect Eleanor. The age difference was what? Not that much, four years. You know, college freshman, college senior, that yeah. kind of thing. What did you, um, and again, this is a novel, but, you know, historical fiction. What did you, you talked about holding the letters or holding the Xerox. As you're reading this, this is something so very private. And at a time in the 1930s, that this was going on in the White House. I mean, I, I would think you could have gone many different directions with this sure. book. Sure. I mean, what was so compelling for me was, first of all, this love story that had been torn out of history. I mean, literally torn out of history because in the White House, in the press clipping room, they used to just cut out Lorena's photograph. She is at every family dinner. She is at every holiday dinner. And she is always standing right next to Eleanor or with her hand on her shoulder or right behind her chair. And they would just snip her out of the photos. And I thought, what must it be like to look at your own family photo album and see that you are not there? That that dinner that you helped, helped arrange and that outfit that you chose with your beloved so that your outfits would be kind of coordinated in sort of a very private way, you're just not in the picture at all. So there was that and there was also my feeling that the story had been, that they had almost lost each other, that it was a surprise that they came together. They were both quite surprised, I think. They were not girls. I don't think either of them expected this kind of deep love affair 
in their 40s, and, um, and one of them married to the President of the United States. And um, they sort of found each other, lost each other, and found each other again. And I think those were the two things that really pushed me towards the story. And Lorena really does come across in her own letters as just a real straight-talking dame. She's just a good old fashioned Which you would find broad. fascinating. Yeah, just a, you know, just a, a tough cookie, always was in the newsroom, was always the only woman in a room full of men, and um, held her own for many years. And when she gave it up, she gave it up knowing that she was not going to have a career as a journalist after she left to promote and pr protect Eleanor Roosevelt. Amy, the, um, the response, and it's not even out yet, the responses are glowing about this book. Esquire said this is one of the 27 books to read in 2018. That's going to make you feel great because it's nice. <laughs> is, this, is this like giving away a child once it's, done, it's sent off and the printer's got it and what's it going to look like and how's it going to be received? Well, it, it is all of those things. I mean, thank goodness it's not actually like a child, but um, close enough. And it, it just, it's more that um, there's nothing I can do about it now. I mean, all I can do is hope that people respond to it, that they see the story as I see it, that it moves them. There's a great quote from a, a novelist, uh, John Gardner, who said that the goal when you're a writer is to create a dream that the reader can enter and they don't have to leave until they close the book. And that's really my goal, that they, that you don't read it as a historical novel. You read it when you open the page, there you are in 1932, and it's happening and you're inside the world and you don't leave it till you close the book when you wrote it how many revisions did oh you my do gosh. in your head oh and, that's just excruciating and did you want to go one way but you ended up going another way as the most writers find thing, i think for me in this book was finding the narrator i knew it wasn't going to be eleanor that voice is so distinct and so well known in in sort of our own ears that i didn't want her to be the narrator. I also didn't want to narrate it from the inside. I wanted somebody with, in, in some ways with whom I could identify more, somebody who would be an outsider to the White House. The White House at that time, one of the things that was so much fun writing about, was like a boarding house. Oh, sure. I mean, there were tons of people who had no relationship to the Roosevelts at all. There was a cabinet member. His wife died. He had a five-year-old. He moved in because he didn't know what to do with the little girl. And so Eleanor would like take her to meetings you know, just to keep her company because nobody knew what to do with her. There was um, FDR's campaign manager who was dying, who was on the third floor with an oxygen tent. There was his mistress who had been his secretary who had a series of strokes. So she was also tucked away on the third floor. There was Princess Martha from Norway during World War II who decided to hang out in the White House for two years. And a lesbian love affair going on in the White House at the same time. It was a busy place. <laughs> When you finished the book, um, was it what you wanted? Well, you think? I think it was as close as I could get. I think there is something about the nature of this kind of endeavor, which is that you're always going to fall a little short. You're always going to fail, even if it's not apparent exactly where. But I feel like I wanted to make a love story that anybody who is interested in love, especially in love that is not just kind of young and gorgeous love, would, would want to be engaged with. And I wanted a story that had a lot of behind the scenes in Washington because I love behind the scenes. And I think I did succeed in bringing those things together so that it's intimate and you also have this big sweep of history from, you know, 19... 32 to 1945, and then the rest of their lives together until Eleanor's death in the early 60s. What was it like when you opened that box? Do you remember? Take me back to that day in the presidential library. Well, you know, they take the archives very seriously, so it's not like you're going in there with your phone or a pen. You have your pencil, you have your paper, and they wheel out the carts. It's like, it's like a, a dim sum brunch. I mean, they just wheel, <laughs> wheel out the carts, and there are the 18 boxes, and I think you get maybe eight at a time, six at a time. And to see the letters, and also to read the language. I mean, there's a, 
really lovely letter from Eleanor to Lorena, and she says, I feel terrible when, when I spoke to you on the phone tonight, Jimmy, which is one of the Roosevelt sons, was standing right next to me, and so I couldn't say to you as I wanted to, I love you, I adore you, and I'm so sorry I couldn't say it. And that was the moment I thought, oh, this is not a correspondence between pals. Sure. And, and I thought, oh, there it is. They, they love each other so, and it is difficult and funny and comic, and for me, one of the great pleasures was imagining the relationship between Lorena and Franklin, because he is a smart man, and all of his wives' friends are lesbians, and you know, he appoints Frances Perkins, the first woman in the cabinet, who is also a lesbian. Um, this is, these are not people who were unaware or clueless or Victorian. These were all pretty sophisticated people who... Um, who were actually living out their lives. Who were, who were living their lives, Franklin in some sense more openly than Eleanor, for sure. But um, she also pushed ahead to live her life out loud, as Zola would have said, in her political views. And it ended how? Well, it ends, you know, sometimes as long time affairs do, or even long time marriages, sort of more with a whimper than a bang, which is that they continue to be friends, they see each other less. Lorena falls in, well, I wouldn't say she falls in love, but she, she has a love affair in which she is much loved, and she is certainly very fond of the other person, who's a very well-known judge. And, um, and they write to each other always, and there's one really lovely visit that they have at, towards the end of Eleanor's life. She's in her late 70s and she's quite ill and I allow myself to give them the ending that I would like them to have, which is, it is um, heartbreaking, but it is never a waste to love somebody, even if it doesn't work out. I see a little tear in your eye. I feel for these women, I really do. I feel for them, I feel like they loved each other so, and it was such a difficult world that they found themselves in. And they were both actually very honest people. They did not wish to lie about who they were, and it was impossible to tell the truth about who they were. The letters that were burned, mm. what happened? Well, what, what's striking about it is that, as I say, it's never Eleanor. It's always Lorena going, you, you can't do that. No, you can't kiss me in public. You can't stand there with your arm around my waist all the time. And she burned the letters, as she said, and this is, this is a fact, as she said to Anna Roosevelt, she burned them because, sweetheart, your mother... Who was their daughter. Who was, the, who was uh, Eleanor's only daughter. She said, Anna, I burned them because, sweetheart, your mother was not always discreet. Interesting. And she did not want that in Eleanor Roosevelt's archives. So the book is about to roll out now. We, we've got sort of a preview of what's happening already. Um, the tour will be how long? A year, you hope? <laughs> I mean, do, do you hope in this day and age um, of the Me Too times that this is embraced and, um, and opens up all kinds of doors? Well, that always seems like a good idea. But I think that... Um, my hope is that people who still like to read, and we love those people, people who like to read, people who like history, people who like literature, people who like romance, that this will be a great experience for them. I think in terms of um, the Me Too movement, I mean, I think there is a lot to be said for it. I also think nothing is new. I will say that one of the things I have learned reading so much history is how many times we go around the block, whether it is women's rights or women's silence or the split in this country between the progressive and the conservative, to read about the Roosevelts, to read about President Roosevelt being hanged in effigy at country clubs across America for being a traitor to his class is to recognize that this is not the first time in America we have been at the foot of the ma mountain looking up and thinking, oh my goodness, what now? Speaking of what now, what's next? Do you have another book in you at this point? I hope so. Um, I, I think that I have three more books coming. I think there really? one will be a historical novel again. 
I think actually about Marie Curie and her mm. extraordinary family since she won two Nobel Prizes in her lifetime and her daughter won one in 1935, the year after Marie Curie dies, for work based on Marie Curie's research. And they're just a fascinating, tough, interesting, complicated, oddball group of people. So I find myself quite drawn to them. And um, I'll let you know more about it when I come back from Krakow in Paris. And, um, and then a collection of short stories is sort of set in, the, in the, our world, the contemporary world. And then I think a mystery. Really? Yes, set in the 1950s during sort of the height of McCarthyism and the witch hunt. So you have outlines already, kind of. Sort, sort of. of, yes. Right. Nothing you'd really want to have to show to other people because they'd laugh at you. But, but you've got ideas. I, I do. I have a few ideas. I have a couple of index cards in my drawer. So, Madam Curie, you're, you're going to go to Poland and you're going to go to Paris. Oh, my. To just be among all of the things she touched. Yes, which, which are still radioactive. I mean, when you go to the Curie Labs, you, really? There are things that you, there are, there are lead lined rooms that you can't enter because a hundred years later the stuff is still off the charts with the Geiger counter. The reason she dies at 66 is because she walks yeah. around with the stuff in her pocket. Yeah. And they're so excited about it. You know, Pierre Curie tapes a little tube of radium to his arm just to see how long does it take to burn your skin because it occurs to them that um, if it can take something away, it can also take away something that is pathological, that is harmful to the body, is not just the things that are good. Um, and, and they are fascinating, and they're also very funny because they're extremely single-minded. And um, Marie Curie, apparently, this little tiny lady, never backs down. Never backs down, not, not once. I love that. Yeah, she, no, she's, she's just tiny and made of steel. So you're writing this already, I can tell, because there's I am, a lot in I your am head so, I am sort already. of writing it already. Well, because I cannot just stay with Eleanor and Franklin and Lorena as much as I love them, because they're sort of done. They're, they're, right. they're, they're in their book, and now I feel like sort of for White Houses, now it's up to the readers. Now it's up to other people to make it their own. Well, I can't wait for people to read it. Amy Bloom's White Houses... New York Times best-selling author. Thanks so much for coming on. Oh, thanks for having us all. <laughs> you betcha. <laughs>